Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our session on the new agenda for Asia. I'm Zani Minton Beddoes from The Economist, and um, I'm delighted to be moderating this session where I hope we will be uh, discussing how business can take a leadership, a greater leadership role in fostering cooperation among Asia's economies. Uh, I can think of few things, frankly, that are more important for the world economy than this topic. Uh, the East Asian region, East and Southeast Asian region, is the fastest growing part of the world. It has some of the world's most dynamic economies. Uh, it's a, a region that is growing ever more integrated, but it is one uh, against which there is a background of ongoing geopolitical tension, uh, whether it's the South China Sea, whether it's the East China Sea. And it is, I think, then very striking, the contrast between an, a part of the world where the future is being built remarkably fast, and yet history looms remarkably large. And we all know what those tensions are, and I think we won't be focusing on the tensions per se, but we will be focusing on the consequences thereof, and particularly the role that business can play in mitigating them and in developing the kind of economic integration that will ensure maximum prosperity. To have that conversation, I have here an extraordinary collection of individuals who are playing individually an enormously important role in that integration. So very briefly, because none of them need any introduction, Victor Chu, Chairman and CEO of First Eastern Investment Group. Next to him, Tony Fernandez, Group Chief CEO of Air Asia in Malaysia. Next to him, Chairman Yorohiko Kojima, Chairman of the Board of the Mitsubishi Corporation. Welcome. Next to him, Dr. Kil Jong Woo, Member of Parliament of the Republic of Korea. And finally, but last but not least, John Riadi, Executive Director of the Lippo Group in Indonesia. So we have a very broad spectrum of countries represented, but all of you, uh, I think, are engaged in the same mission, which is to boost integration through what you are, are doing. And so I'd like to start with a, uh, a very broad um, question, actually, of all of you, because I think you'll all have a different perspective, but maybe, Victor, we'll start with you, which is, can you characterize for me, first of all, how the geopolitical tensions affect the business environment? And then secondly, what do you see as the role of business in mitigating them? Sandy, thank you very much, and good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Before I respond to that question, I, you're from London. I am. Right? And may I congratulate uh, Britain on Her Majesty's becoming the longest serving monarch. Uh, tomorrow, I think it's a special day. I think it's, to, depending on where you are in the date line, I guess it's today. Absolutely. So, <laughs> congratulations. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, um, obviously, the macro geopolitical tensions uh, affect business. But as all of us here, we are, our, our business are global. And despite the tensions, we are cooperating with each other very, very well indeed. Uh, Chinese companies are cooperating with Japanese companies in projects in the Middle East and Africa and worldwide, and, and vice versa. And the, the, the point we have to remember is that these tensions are long-term historical tensions. And it would take a lot of time and effort to find a reasonable and mutually satisfactory conclusion. I mean, there are three scenarios, basically. If we can't find a reasonable solution, we go into conflict. And that is a lose-lose scenario. If the parties agree for the issue to be arbitrated or mediated, which is difficult, it will be a loose win situation because one part will, will, will prevail, the other part will lose. If we can find a way to cooperate and build trust to find a lasting solution without conflict, that's win-win. So all things have been equal, the answer is simple. And we in the business world understand that we, despite the tension, we have been integrating, cooperating very well. I mean, the important thing is that the, the other stakeholders in the game, uh, the politicians, civil society, and indeed the media, we, ha we, have to, we have to join forces to make sure that we find the right solution. Can I press you on that last point? Because it's, very, it's I think, very important. 
What role can you in business play in influencing the public debate, in influencing, frankly, in, in, in getting the message to the media, civil society, and indeed the politicians? Do you see a role there for business? Absolutely. I mean, exactly what we're doing here, we need to articulate that despite the, the political uh, uh, difficulties, we in business, we are contributing to the regional growth and prosperity. I mean, today's society, we're talking about jobs. We're talking about making sure there are more equality. We're talking about sustainability. We're talking about how to help the underprivileged to get up to the, to, 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 to the acceptable line. We're talking about how to educate our young people in the best way possible. We're not talking about conflicts. And the young, I think the younger people amongst us even resonate that much stronger. That's very interesting. Maybe I can, Chairman Kojimi, I, I can turn to you now and get your perspective. Do you agree with Victor Chu and his characterization of the role that business has? Yeah, oh, okay, well, yeah, frankly speaking, and uh, uh, I agree with this comment and uh, say, I'll explain about our company. And uh, maybe everybody said, uh, Mitsubishi Corporation is a trading company. And uh, used to be a trading company. But uh, now, trading profit is a 20 to 30 percent. 70 to 80 percent is investment profit. And uh, this means we have already invested more than 600 throughout the world. And uh, this investment is very important. We need a very reliable partner country by country. Therefore, uh, geopolitical problem is, uh, firstly, we need a very reliable partner country by country and always uh, communicate each other. And uh, also, the other communication is the uh, government and uh, a, a business people should have a communication also from time to time. And therefore, of course, in Japan, I have uh, always uh, communication with our prime minister or our ministers. This is very important. And also, even for the foreign countries, I try to make a communication with the uh, governmental people as well. And uh, it used to be a trading company. But the, therefore, we need a, a say, so-called trading profit. But the important <coughs> issue is the uh, investment, not only money, but also human resources to that uh, subsidiary company. Uh, therefore, uh, important issue is uh, now the trading company business model invests not only money, but also human resources. Yeah. And uh, this means the management, education is uh, very important, not only in Japan, but globally. And uh, then those uh, our people, be a CEO or a CFO in the uh, subsidiary company, to add the value for those companies. And uh, this will be uh, contributing to the uh, profit of that country as well. This is very important. It, it Therefore, is. based upon that, I am always prepared to discuss with the government people or foreign government people. And when you discuss with your government, do, do you tell them that the geopolitical backdrop has a difference, makes a difference to your company? And do you offer them advice on this? Yeah, I'll uh, say, of course, we'll uh, explain about our company's business. But uh, besides that, and uh, those related the business circumstances is also the uh, sometimes uh, geopolitical uh, problems. But how to resolve those problems? That is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Therefore, country by country, geopolitical problems are different. Mm -hmm. Therefore, country by country, we need a very reliable partner there. And uh, we can discuss very frankly, and uh, we'll get uh, very, very uh, uh, good information about the countries. And uh, that, that is good. And uh, then based upon that, we should discuss, negotiate sometimes with our government. Dr. Gill, you, you uh, are looking at this from a slightly different perspective as a member of parliament and, and from the Korean perspective. How do you react to uh, the um, two speakers before and what is your sense of the role that business is playing and should play uh, in the well, geopolitical these, tensions? These people are, are business people. I'm a politician, 
But uh, let me focus on Northeast Asia, consisting of uh, China, Japan, and Korea. Uh, the trade volume of uh, three countries takes around 18% of global trade. And they're in GDP, around 21% of whole uh, global GDP. But you probably know uh, about the terminology of Asia's paradox. Asia's paradox means three Northeastern countries economically prosperous and very big potential, but they are victimized by themselves due to their historical animosity. So when you are asking about the uh, kind of business communities mitigating role of political tensions, I would better say, this is a regret, but I should better say that economic community are negatively affected by political tensions. So the structural reason, or probably outcome of the political tensions is intra-regional trade volume of, among three countries is slightly over 22%, much lower than really anticipated, comparing with the 40% of NAFTA, 56% of EU. So I think those kind of uh, very limit, and it's getting smaller, I can say that reflects the business communities are negatively affected by political tensions. But do you think there is anything that the business community can do to affect the political debate that you are taking part in? There are surely a couple of good examples of business communities when we are talking about the Korea-Japan kind of uh, tensions due to many different issues. Uh, business communities, especially Federation of Korea Industries, and their counterpart in Japan, uh, Geidan Nen, had a meeting and they made a kind of joint recommendation to each government. So business kind of cultural climate should not be uh, jeopardized by political tensions. <coughs> but not exactly the kind of each business uh, company or uh, big companies can play a role. Their role is very limited uh, and vice versa, I think. The government role is predominant. <coughs> than jo business committees. John, do you agree with that? I mean, this is from, from an Indonesian perspective, a very big player, uh, economically, demographically, from a slightly different part of the region. How, when you listen to this conversation, what do you see the impact on business, and how do you see the role of business in mitigating these tensions? Uh, thank you, Zani. I think, undoubtedly, uh, the larger geopolitical context uh, certainly has an impact on business. Uh, as many of you may have read over the last few weeks, uh, Indonesia held the auction for the Jakarta-Bandung uh, fast-speed railway. Uh, it was very, very rigorously contested uh, by China and Japan. And this is, an, this is a strategically very important project because the railroads that you build for this first bit will determine the railroads and the systems and the cars that you use for the entire nation. So, you know, between Japan and China, clearly there was, you know, there was, it, it's not just business. Uh, there was allegations of um, one party stealing elements of the other party's bids. There were elements of illegal, uh, you know, bids sort of violating the, the, the bid uh, process. Um, and, and so you can clearly see that the geopolitical context affects that. And also um, there was, you know, not, not to mention the, uh, the American uh, consulting firms who the Indonesian media believes to be sort of corporate CIA spies. <laughs> so the, 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 there is all elements of that. But I think if you take a step back. So what happened? <laughs> well, in the end, the government said that we actually don't need the fast speed railway. We need a medium. <laughs> we need a medium speed railway because the distances between each stop is actually too close for a fast speed railway that the cost is too expensive. So I think the government of Indonesia was pressured immensely by both sides. They were not able to make a decision. I hope that, I mean, that is a, if that is a, epitomizes the impact, that is very depressing, right? That you end up not having either because of the geopolitically uh, pressed rivalry. Yeah. So what can be done? But I, but, but I think if you take a step back, generally businesses are progressing. Generally, economic integration is happening, as Mr. Chu had mentioned, despite the geopolitical context. But I think another element that I'd like to bring into the discussion today is we often talk about the geopol uh, geopolitical risk in terms of sort of uh, the tensions between both countries. 
I think it's important to, to, to see that I think in today's world, the context that businesses operate is not just sort of the traditional geopolitical risks, but it's also what people are often saying now, it's sort of um, uh, the geopolitical risk of technology. We are now, you know, I believe, moving away from the Westphalian system of nation states towards a more borderless world, driven in large part by technology. So governments, you know, businesses, politicians, everyone, I think we cannot view, I think the boundaries between countries are, are fast vanishing. Uh, and we all have to recognize that, and this has huge repercussions on, on how businesses operate, how governments regulate, and how trade has to happen. So in short, I think the world needs new institutional infrastructure to, that better reflects the underlying economic activity of, of, of the world. And is that um, blurring of boundaries, whether it's in cyberspace or whether it is in, in new technologies broadly, does it um, make it easier to deal with the, the, the geopolitical tensions that are there in the, in the kind of world of nation states? Well, I, I think geopolitical risk has always occurred. Since you know, 1648, when the Treaty of Westphalia was signed, um, we, you know, the world has, it has, has functioned on, on the basic assumption of the, the sovereignty of the nation state. That still exists today, but I think the whole concept of the so sovereignty of nation states is coming, coming uh, into conflict with the realities of technology and the borderless world that we live in. You know, for, I'll give you a few examples in Southeast Asia. The largest sort of taxi app booking company is, was founded in Malaysia, and now it's all over Southeast Asia. The company that's disrupting uh, how groceries are bought and sold was started in Indonesia and now has gone all over the world. The way properties are bought and sold, Singapore company now is also disrupting the whole property agent industry across Southeast Asia. Governments in Indonesia, for example, can no longer say, this is my territory, this is how I'm going to, to regulate it. I think the fact of the matter is it's a borderless world, so we've got to live with that new reality. Tony, last but absolutely not least to you, you're, you, uh, um, you're not in the virtual world, you're very much in the real world in your industry, but you epitomize the integration of countries. Uh, how do you see uh, the backdrop of geopolitical tensions? Is it something that concerns you? Uh, and how do you think business should react and help mitigate? Well, I mean, <clears throat> you know, when there are geopolitical tensions, we're a low-cost airline, so we encourage politicians to fly with us and go and meet with each other <laughs> often. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, save money. <laughs> Geopolitics is a, is a real problem. It's a problem for us in reality, especially in the aviation business. Uh, when countries don't get on with each other, the first thing they do is block air rights. Um, and so it's, it's a real issue. I agree with John that the, the new world is moving away from borders because governments are less involved. But the old world, there is very much um, repercussions from uh, geopolitics. How can business um, help really is uh, what was said earlier in terms of good dialogue, getting the message across. My message the whole time is jobs and that tensions between two countries cause jobs to be lost um, in tourism, in related industries. So it's constant uh, dialogue to show uh, the benefit in Southeast Asia there are tensions on the Spratly Islands which have you know, caused lots of aviation-related issues. What we can do is constant dialogue. It's painful, but I think business does play a big part. Within our own region in ASEAN, we've, a few of us have driven uh, ASEAN integration, probably further than the governments would. You've got to have a, a necessity for regionalization. Mm -hmm. What does ASEAN mean? And business plays a, a very central role in that. You know, we've created an ASEAN airline uh, through this process. So um, I, I think business plays a, a huge importance um, in disagreeing a little bit with what was said earlier. Yes, ultimately the politicians uh, will decide, but I think business plays a big part and must continue to play a big part. Um, and I think the, the new technology world has shown that there is a borderless world coming. That's interesting. That's an area where you can get beyond the nation state and the borderless. And we'll get to that because I think that's a very interesting part to dwell on. I wanted to, to, to switch slightly though to, and, and ASEAN provides a perfect segue, to the question of the sort of the regional architecture and how, whether it's regional partnerships, regional trade agreements, how the way they are drawn up sets the backdrop for economic integration and whether it kind of reinforces 
geopolitical tensions or whether it mitigates them. And, and, and to be a bit more concrete, you know, one sort of way of looking at it is, is the is TPP, for example, becoming you know, the gauge by which American leadership in the region is measured? Is it uh, an integrative view of the region? How do you see the various different economic partnerships um, fitting together? And will they help diffuse geopolitical tensions or will they actually exacerbate them? Victor. Well, th this is a very, very important question. I, I need to disclose my, my interest here. Um, personally, I'm dead against these regional uh, deals because they undermine the, the multilateral uh, system. And although it's not perfect, the multilateral trading system in the form of WTO is the best and the most the fairest, the most non-discriminatory system we have. And when you have bilateral deals or regional deals, you undermine the system. But be that as it may, um, if there's no um, conclusion on the multilateral system, of course, the second best is regional blocks. And you hope that these regional blocks benchmark to standards that eventually will harmonize into a multilateral system. Now, the difficulty here is that we have, we have two parties. We have the ASEAN, maybe ASEAN plus three. Uh, that's, the train has already left the station. And we have the prospect of a TPP. And the TPP started, rightly or wrongly, as a partial containment on the rise of China, right? uh, despite the rhetoric. I mean, that's really that's the, 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 the psychology. But today, it probably has been driven more down into the middle, that uh, um, TPP uh, founding partners welcomes China's um, uh, participation on, on the table, although China may not join the TPP uh, right, right start, but it can um, also be a party to the deliberations. So one day, China may become uh, a part of that. And quite frankly, without China, uh, TPP would not really be a meaningful um, block for, for this particular uh, region. And then you have the ASEAN uh, um, economic community, and that is already in, in effect. The difficulty there is that if you have two of the three largest members of ASEAN facing huge domestic issues, how can we drive that forward in full steam? I think we need to see, and we need to work hard at that to make sure that um, it, it, it works well. Actually, I think, Tony, why don't we ask, ask you and John of that? Uh, yeah. Let's focus on ASEAN. And, oh, all right, Dr. Gill, and then well, we'll I move. think when we talk about kind of regional trade kind of uh, uh, integration. First of all, we should uh, throw out some kind of geostrategic, ill-directed analysis of TPP is led by the United States versus RCEP, a regional comprehensive economic partnership initiated by China. We should free ourselves from that kind of geostrategic uh, kind of analysis more integrated in the region, I think uh, less possibility of uh, kind of military regional confrontation. Uh, so I think there is a TPP and RCEP, or in addition to them, the kind of transatlantic or trans-Pacific uh, economic uh, partnership. That might be good. Surely, I uh, joined the, uh, the victor about the kind of that should that might undermine the multilateral trade rule under the WTO. But uh, kind of going back to the past experience of what happened in the region, I think more integrated is better for the time being. But, but we could, I'm sure, all agree that it would be a good thing to have a broader integration with as many countries as possible in it. But the reality is right now, we have a TPP negotiations with a particular set of countries, and we have an RCEP with a particular different set of countries, and we have ASEAN. So we do have these different but overlapping um, trade tracks. So do you think the current trade tracks are um, alleviating or reinforcing sort of geopolitical divisions? We should wait and see. But I, in principle, the more integrated. I think that is not the, the conflict between trade regimes, I think. In, in addition to that, I, we should focus on kind of uh, President Xi Jinping's idea of AIIB, kind of the Silk Road, 
those kind of new ideas might be a good addendum to lead the future of uh, the whole region in a kind of a more kind of cooperative uh, manner. Tony, what's your perspective from, from the, the, uh, well, I think the Malaysian view? Well, everything's been focused on trade. Regionalization is not just about trade. And uh, in my case, in ASEAN, it's about harmonization of standards, it's about human rights, it's about proper institutions and proper standards. Uh, I think economic blocks are very important. I'm a big supporter of them. You can have as many trade groups as you want, because the more interaction we have, the better. But I think we shouldn't look at ASEAN just from a trading uh, necessity. There's lots of, lots of benefits in having a regional economic uh, integration. And look, ASEAN was started as a political uh, form yet, and it was a very successful political um, organization in keeping the peace in what was a very unstabilized, destabilized area. But now it's moved more to an economic block. But I think ASEAN has much more to offer than just trading. And um, really, that's what we've been driving for. You know, in, in Europe, you have a joint aviation authority, one sky, one standard. Uh, in ASEAN, we have 10 standards. So that increases the cost dramatically. Um, lots of bureaucracy in moving goods between 10 countries where, where costs can be removed. Different standards of human rights different standards of political institutions. When you're in one group, you hopefully go to the highest common denominator of uh, those standards. So I think uh, regional blocks are more important than just actually looking at the trading side. And, and how do you respond to Victor's comment about uh, the difficulty when you have two of the major players um, with their own domestic challenges? Is that a... a well, I'm not sure which of the two there. I, <laughs> I, I can think, of, I can think of more than two, to be honest. <laughs> Chairman, Chairman Kojima, g give me your perspective, um, particularly on what role you see TPP playing. Where are you on this debate? Yeah. Well, uh, before that, I'd like to mention something about Asia. Sure. Yeah. Asia is a very, very important uh, country for the world because uh, population is now increasing. And uh, maybe 50% uh, of the total population of the world is Asia. And 40% of the global GDP is Asia. And in that sense, Asia is very, very important. Therefore, in that sense, uh, geopolitical problem and so many problems, we have to resolve each other. In that sense, communication through the uh, countries, particularly Asia, is very important. And in that sense, uh, talking about the uh, investment uh, you know, agreement type of thing, okay? Uh, RCEP, RCEP. This is uh, now it's uh, included and it's very very important. And uh, besides that, and uh, I think TPP is also very important to include everybody, but uh, not necessarily all of the country together. But uh, step by step, this TPP will be uh, increased, and uh, because. Communication is uh, very important. Therefore, global, so many countries' communication, it's not so easy to make it the same. Yeah. Mm. Uh, do, you, do you expect that TPP will eventually include China? Yeah, I do think so. Yeah. Does that, everybody the, on the panel? That's interesting. Do you all think, let's say, let's yeah, say yeah. within Maybe. 10 years, <laughs> will China be in no TPP? No reason not to join. No reason? Not to I think if a TPP will ultimately succeed, it will include China. Interesting. Uh, I, I might ask, I would ask the audience to raise their hands, but I won't be able to see because it's so dark. But it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting <laughs> question whether China will. John, let's turn to your perspective uh, on regional integration and these, these particular partnerships. Where do you see the mosaic going? Yeah. I, I, I take a very pragmatic approach to, to you know, uh, the question of uh, you know, which trade agreement or which institutional infrastructure. And I think ultimately the, the best institutional infrastructure, whether it's trade agreements or the AIB, things like this, the, the best one will be the ones that best reflect the underlying economic realities. So for example, if there's a, tr if there's a trade block that attempts to uh, not include um, the country with whom for many Asian nations it's already the number one trading partner, it's not going to work. If there's an institution whose voting structures do not adequately reflect the balance of power between sort of today's e economic powers, 
it, over time it's going to lose, lose credibility and it's not going to work. In the meantime, before we get there, I, I believe in free markets. Let the RCEP compete with TPP, let it compete with ASEAN plus six, plus three, you know, whatever it may be, and ultimately it'll converge at some equilibrium. And I think the market equilibrium will work towards the equilibrium that best reflects the, the situation at hand. I'm going to open the floor to some questions, and then we'll have an, another round of conversation between us, because I'm sure you've all made some very interesting and quite provocative points, so I'm sure there will be some questions. Um, is there, are there any, any questions? I'm now going to have to put my glasses on so I can see. Have you all been cowed into silence by the discussion? <laughs> well, how about I give you some, a few minutes to think of some questions, and we'll have another round of comments. Oh, no, there's a lady here. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Aniko, Singapore Management University. Um, I like the fact that you are the lady and we have a whole group of men there. Yeah, at least there's some diversity. Um, I'm really curious. I think um, we are winding down to be post-2015 for ASEAN. And I think for Japan and Korea looking from outside in, what are some of your hopes for ASEAN going forward? And actually, how do you build an ASEAN identity? Why don't we start, Tony, with you, and then uh, John? I, I think that's an identity is a, a really good question. There isn't one, really. And it's been something that I've been pushing for a long, long time. Even our regional games is called the Sea Games, Southeast Asian Games, and I've been pushing for it to be renamed the ASEAN Games. It took me about five years to persuade governments to have an ASEAN lane at airports so that at least people in ASEAN feel there's a little bit of benefit from that. So I think it's a, it's a huge battle, but it's a battle worth uh, pushing. I think ASEAN is critical, um, especially in light of what Victor said. He said two countries, I actually think there's a hell of a lot more than two countries that are in a mess. Uh, but ASEAN can provide a, a really uh, a leadership role in trying to solve some of the um, domestic issues. So I hope that the power of the ASEAN Secretariat grows much more. There are many more ASEAN institutions um, and there are ASEAN standards. Um, the ASEAN brand at the moment is meaningless, in my opinion. I think governments have failed. Uh, we promote ourselves as an ASEAN airline uh, very aggressively. Just to get the logo of ASEAN onto my aircraft took three years. Uh, so there's a, there's a long battle ahead but I do think it's um, moving. I mean, the World Economic Forum has recognized ASEAN and is doing a lot in pushing that and has helped me and others in, in championing that. So I hope for a common market. I hope for a, a common human rights standard and strong political institutions uh, going forward. And I think going back, um, communication is key and uh, that's the most important part and use the best standards. John, what's your perspective on the ASEAN identity? Uh, thanks for the question, Annie. You know, you should actually be the one here answering your own question. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's very important to remember that ASEAN is a, is, is a hundred-year-old journey. Um, you know, my grandfather talks about his time in the, you know, early, um, in the mid-1900s, where, you know, you, uh, when, sorry, in the, in the my great-grandfather, when you go from what is now Malaysia to Indonesia to Vietnam on a boat off and on, no passports, no nothing, when the, ASE the ASEAN region was a single economic, social, political unit. Um, and then obviously in the 1940s and 50s, you've got the rise, of, you know, the end of colonialization, the rise of um, the, the independence movements across, across the ASEAN countries. You've got the peak of disintegration with the confrontasi, the Sukarno confrontasi activities in the 70s. It was then that the ASEAN said, we, we have to come together and, and make peace. And, 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 and slowly, since the 70s, we've been slowly, slowly, slowly reintegrating. So I think 2015 is an important milestone, uh, but it's only a milestone, and I think we've got a long journey ahead. Now, how we do that going forward, I think Tony's mentioned a number of great examples. Um, for, for us, you know, we continue to look at investments globally. Uh, Indonesia is our home, but you know, we, we look at ASEAN as a, as a whole region. Uh, so I think investments, you know, the role of that businesses play in integrating the region will be very, very critical. <laughs> Number two, I think, is also the people-to-people -people movement. And I think that probably the single biggest uh, contributing factor to this has been sort of low-cost carriers. 
hundreds of, you know, tens of millions of Indonesians are now able to go to Singapore and Malaysia and Vietnam thanks to low-cost carriers in a way that before this they would not, you know, they, they are not able to. Um, so I think business is investing, people to people, um, and I think governments have to, have to do more. Can, can I throw one very quick point, actually, which John, uh, just, you know, when you talk about business using integration, business also causes some of the geopolitical tension sometimes and actually causes some of the uh, trade issues because of protectionism. I think that's one of the huge yeah. dangers. Yeah. Of, you can have TPP, APP, whatever initial the Americans and Chinese and Japanese come up with, but one of the big problems is nationalism. Yeah. And I see a growing threat of nationalism which will derail a lot of uh, the good work that's being done. So, Where do you see that threat to be the greatest? Sorry? Where do you see that I, threat? I, I can't tell you that now because uh, <laughs> I'll be banned from flying everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> my mouth is my biggest problem, actually. Uh, so, um, but <laughs> it's there. I confront it head on um, in those countries because I think sometimes the vested interests within countries yep. are the biggest problem. And I keep telling governments, put people first. Does ASEAN make sense for, the, for every Indonesian, Malaysian? History has shown successful economic collaboration and standards affect people. So I think I just turn your point on ahead that actually business, business sometimes cause the problem. Cause the problem yeah, that's a very good point you know? to make. And it's crazy things, if you look at history, defense industries sometimes rise the threat of geopolitical, you know, the armaments industry, the need to keep things going. You know, we see both sides being in commercial aviation and also we see the other side in the, so business plays also a negative part. That's a, I think that's a very important but I, point to make. I Don't wouldn't single out businesses, Tony. I think it's special interest, right? Businesses sometimes are the problem, but also other times, let's say labor unions or professional associations. You know, these are also oftentimes uh, people who, who work against integration. Yeah, it's all, it's all down to communication and showing and governments take the easy option sometimes, right? Yeah. And also companies let, take let, the easy let, option. Let, Dr. Gill. Any, any, uh, let, let me, uh, have a rather the blunt kind of question back is when I've traveled to South, East, South ASEAN countries and meeting with my friends there, they are struggling with the kind of identity. My question to them is why? Why ASEAN countries should struggle with their own identity? ASEAN has provided a very constructive and productive platform for economic integration. And ASEAN plus three, using that kind of platform, those East Asian three countries really took advantage of their opportunity and platform to meet each other, not only with ASEAN members, but also three countries as well. So uh, some member of 10 ASEAN countries are making the bilateral free trade agreement with other countries. Why, in what direction, if they find the kind of identity, the identity should develop? Let me um, broaden that to a question which I think is sort of, uh, or at least it's a subject that's underlying this, which is the relationship and the impact of China on, on ASEAN and on the countries within it. And, and I'm going to start with you, Victor. And what is your perspective of how, in, in, let's stick with business terms, business and economic terms, China's clearly very rapidly growing importance is changing the nature and the determinants of the integration that we're talking about? Well, I think <clears throat> if you talk about the last 20 years, China has been the largest recipient of FDI coming into Asia. And there's a lot of overflow of those FDI into the ASEAN region, which is positive. Secondly, the, the Xi Jinping's you know, One Belt, One Row program uh, that will you know, trigger off a lot of opportunities in infrastructure and other services and other investments into ASEAN and beyond. And of course, the AIIB, um, there's a, a full of ASEAN uh, uh, members there. You know, hopefully, they will cooperate hand in hand with ADB and, and other international organizations. So ASEAN plus three is actually, um, without the plus three, I think it will lose the, 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 um, the scale. The ASEAN itself is, is big, but with plus three, mm -hmm. is huge. And that is where ASEAN as a community 
will become one of the three-legged tours in the world. That has the, the as, a, as, a, as a group, you have bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis North America and, and the euro. Tony? Sorry, what was the question? Uh, uh, the question was how you <laughs> reacted. You were nodding and then you were kind of, you know... Victor Not speaks completely. in very powerful English, so <laughs> <laughs> I lose him sometimes. The, 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 the impact of China and how you see it... In uh, it's it's in, in strictly linked. I mean, if you look at my business, you know, 20% of our business comes from China. Um, we've opened up so many routes, 19 routes from China into Southeast Asia, uh, that it's, it's, I can see the link growing and growing and growing. It's, it, it's, it's there, it's been there historically, it'll continue. We also have a big Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia, so that link is going to grow and get stronger, and I, I think it's, it's a good thing that that will happen. Do we have any more questions? Yes, gentleman here at the front. I'd just like to raise the issue of refugees, because what, uh, what we are hearing today is that Asia is progressing. GDP growth is much better than anywhere in the world, and the countries are getting richer. So when do you see governments and business in Asia open up their borders to have their fair share of the burden of the refugees trying to get out of their war-torn countries? That's an extremely important and very interesting question. I'm not entirely sure that it is um, wholly part of the discussion right now. So I'm going to offer it to anyone if they would like to comment, um, but don't feel that you have to. You, yes. you remind me that the yesterday one of my colleagues at the National Assembly kind of had a press briefing in Korea in Seoul. So Korea, as a responsible member of the international community, Korea should join in discussion and think about the uh, possible contribution on the kind of global uh, kind of serious challenges of refugees. I think that reminds me. Yeah. Do you, and do you think it should? Well, I think that might be a good start, but Korea, South Korea has been, uh, had a long history of, uh, of kind of migration from North Korea. Uh, we do not say there is refugees, are the same people, <laughs> but 28,000 people and uh, still living with us and the, the more to come. 25 million people living in the northern part of the peninsula. But we should get prepared. So any, different, any kinds of refugees living uh, under the, living, having lived under a different culture and, and the kind of ideology. We should get prepared. I'd, I'd just say one very quick thing, and that's yeah. where, when I went earlier on, basic human rights. ASEAN and many ASEAN country, Asian countries have to solve that very important point. And I think uh, refugees also come from different economic climates. And if you have a sim similar economic environment, then I think that changes. But I think Asia must take its responsibility in dealing with uh, global tension that's caused around the world. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, lady here in the second row. Uh, thank you very much. As we all know that the new round of uh, negotiation about uh, China, Korea, Japan, FTA will be held in a month. So uh, with all of the geographic uh, tensions in uh, Northeast Asia, uh, I really want to ask Mr. Kojima and uh, uh, John Wu about your expectation for the new uh, expectation uh, about this new uh, negotiation. And do you think if we can reach this agreement, we can reach the level of China, uh, Korea, FTA? Thank you. Chairman Kojima. Well, uh, yeah, that is a very good question. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, anyhow, say, uh, we have already developed our business uh, throughout the world. Of course, China, Korea is a very important country. Therefore, we are collaborating. And we invested a lot in China and Korea. And uh, in that sense, uh, from now on, and uh, we like to collaborate together and to develop more business. And uh, sometimes uh, we are developing uh, a third country business. We worked together with the Chinese manufacturer or Korean manufacturer to develop some business, say, ASEAN countries or third countries. And uh, since we have uh, so many offices and uh, so many reliable partners, 
Therefore, we can create so many business in that sense. Those three countries uh, is uh, very, very important to develop uh, the so-called uh, economical development and also uh, peaceful you know, conditions, yes. In that sense, uh, I do think uh, now the three countries uh, top started to speak each other. That's a, that's a very good timing uh, for us. And uh, we business people like to support this. So do you expect progress on this free trade agreement? And will you be going to your government saying there must be progress? Of course, I always tell this to the government. <laughs> and the uh, point is this, it may take some more time. Hmm. Uh, but uh, say, the business people should uh, you know, support this kind of idea. Then uh, since, uh, as I told you, our company has uh, so many reliable yeah. partners, country by country, therefore we can communicate with those people very frankly. And uh, some of them are very, said uh, difficult to communicate with the government and so forth. Okay. And uh, but uh, in our country, I always uh, insist our opinion and uh, to the government. And uh, not only the government is agreeable, but <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, we always communicate. That's okay. very important. Dr. Gil, will, uh, what role did you has, take? Korea has a bilateral uh, free trade agreement, agreement with China. And uh, trilateral free trade, Korea, China, Japan, uh, meeting has been several years actually. But Korea China FTA might be a very much playing a stimulating effect of trilateral FTA as well as TPP. Korea is not the initial member of 12 countries, but I think Korea will join after the TPP is agreed. And TPP progress is also uh, the pushing uh, trilateral uh, FTA. And, but the one, one kind of we should uh, take a look at TPP means to Korea and Japan. This is a bilateral free trade agreement between <coughs> Korea and Japan. The same, most of the similar effect TPP is. So I think TPP and bilateral trade, bilateral FTA between Korea and China will surely a kind of big boost for serious right. dialogue on finalizing trilateral FTA. Yes, sure. Uh, I just want to make one point that uh, uh, President Park, on, his, on her recent visit to Beijing, has managed to arrange a summit between uh, Xi Jinping, uh, Mr. Abe, and President Park in Seoul in October. I mean, that meeting will obviously put some stimulus into the, the economic and trade talks. I think that's very positive. It's a very positive yeah, sign. Right. Uh, any more questions? Yes, a lady at the two-thirds of the way back there, yes. Thank you. I'm a journalist from Taishin Media. Well, I think the panelists just mentioned the influence of geopolitics on high-speed railway, this sector. So in the near term, where are the other sectors that uh, uh, you say could be most influenced by similar geopolitics? Thank you. Positively or negatively? Maybe both. <laughs> Can you restate um, the question? You Can you restate the question, please? I, I, I couldn't yes, quite hear. Yeah. Can you restate the, the question, yes, the please? Yes, the question I... is, you mentioned high-speed rail as a sector that had been influenced by geopolitics. What other examples could the panel give of sectors where they felt particular influence, both either positively or negatively? Maybe you, you can think of another, or Tony? Where are the sectors where, where geopolitics matters most? Well, I think generally, um, industries that are more reliant on some form of a concession, um, whether it be building out a, a fast speed railway or whether it be rights to mine or rights to an oil, oil field, you know, things like that, I think geopolitics will play a larger role uh, as opposed to industries that are generally more free market. And uh, for example, the consumer and services industries um, are just, you know, you sell a product to a consumer, if he or she likes it, he buys it. Uh, so those industries generally, I think, would be more isolated from geopolitical tension. The industries that are yeah. very regulated, regulated and have a lot yeah. of government involvement, obviously, are <laughs> the most in danger of uh, geopolitics. Victor? Yeah, I, I would be a big investor in Tony's uh, Asia, 
Uh, just to give us the check now. <laughs> Just a clear example, <laughs> despite the political tensions between China and Japan, last year, outbound Chinese tourists into Japan was 2.5 million. This year, it's more than double, despite the political tension. Just imagine the political side settled down, and that could be you know, triple. So that is the kind of scenario we're talking about. We need stability, we need people to cooperate, and then business will go from string to string. Dr. Kojimi, yeah. Well, talking about the uh, relationship between China and Japan, and uh, as uh, Chiu san said, uh, you know, so many people were visiting Japan. <laughs> and uh, when uh, I went to the uh, department store, most of the customers are Chinese, yeah. <laughs> frankly speaking. Yeah. And uh, Japanese, uh, you know, Buying department scotch. store. Buying scotch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And uh, they said they are very happy. And uh, the amount of the, you know, uh, buying products is much higher than Japanese, frankly speaking. So, and under such circumstances, the important issue is the uh, uh, talking about the communications about between governmental level. And uh, say, uh, Prime Minister Abe and Premier Xi Jinping, these days try to communicate each other. And, uh, well, uh, last year, last November, and the uh, APEC meeting, and uh, they have a very mm -hmm. intimate friends, mm -hmm. intimate communications. And also, uh, this year, June, and uh, yeah, uh, in Indonesia, Bandan Conference, yes. and uh, Xi Jinping Premier and the Prime Minister Abe also talked very frankly. And uh, now the communication in the governmental level is now uh, starting. Therefore, from now on, I think, and uh, also say, uh, I was uh, a um, vice chairman of the Keidan Ren, and uh, I retired uh, this May, but uh, uh, when I was vice chairman, I visited the Korea, and the uh, Japanese Keidan Ren group and, uh, in Korea, uh, that's uh, uh, Zenkeren, <laughs> yeah, in uh, Korea, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, we communicated with each other. Well, that's that's important progress. That's yeah. very good. Yeah, I therefore, gradually, uh, the, the you know communication start. Communication is the is the first step. I think I have time for one more question. If there's one, yes, gentleman here at the front front row. Thank you. I have a question to Mr. Uh, Victor Chu. You seem to place more importance to a multilateral organization such as WTO as compared to a TPP or a regional uh, uh, arrangement or bilateral arrangement. Do you see these two as a sort of parallel things or do you see a, a regional bilateral agreement as a, a, some sort of a step toward a larger uh, global agreement? Thank you. Uh, I mean, my, my difficulty with bilateral agreements and regional agreements is that it undermines the, the multilateral system, which is the fairest. You know, if you're a small country, you have absolutely no bargaining power against China or the United States. I mean, for example, right? But WTO gives you a, a mechanism so the weakest and the smallest trade nation can have a fair hearing. I mean, that's my starting point. But as I mentioned, um, we don't live in a perfect world. So if the regional deals um, harmonize benchmarks, that eventually we can get when we all the 180 odd country can agree, then I think uh, it can be seen as a, as, a, as a good progress. And also, as Tony said, these regional deals and bilateral deals, they're not just about trading. There are other institutional harmonization that ca has improvement. So obviously, um, if they, break barriers, um, help uh, regional communication, help people to um, understand and respect each other better, um, I think all the better from that point of view. Yeah. Uh, we are fast running out of time, and I <coughs> wanted to give you all one more quick opportunity to um, intervene, and that particularly to answer the following, I hope, call, which is that we started off saying we would try and be concrete and focus on what business can do, 
Perhaps you could all offer one concrete thought of either something that your business is doing or something that you think business should do, and there are clearly many businessmen in this audience, to foster the integration we've been discussing and to ease geopolitical tensions. Let's go that way, starting with you, John. Uh, I think uh, businesses uh, should work with governments to embrace uh, the changes um, in uh, the current sort of economic uh, balance of power towards Asia and China. So for, to be concrete, for Indonesia and many countries in, in Asia, uh, China is today the largest trading partner. And yet we trade with China using US dollars. And in many ways, that's causing many of the difficulties in Indonesia today. Uh, so obviously this cannot be done overnight, but I think more and more and more, uh, we need to be using the, the yen, we need to be using the RMB to, tr to trade with each other. Thank you. Thank we you. should, we should uh, not talk about the impact of China, but rather uh, talk about the role of China in the regional integration. So especially the China is not uh, kind of unilaterally pushing its own idea of dream, but that dream and vision can be shared with other Asian countries. One Belt, One Road, New Silk Road project can be connected with the South Korean President's Eurasia Initiative, and China's AIIB can be collaborated with the South Korean President's Northeast Asian Development Bank. So one big country's dream and vision can be shared with other neighboring countries. That will be the common prosperity, guaranteed. Thank you. Yeah. Chairman Kojima. As I told you, we have almost 200 offices in the world. And uh, maybe we can collect the whole information, what is happening, where. And uh, in that sense, uh, we are a bit concerned about uh, yeah, geopolitical situation, uh, serious problem. And uh, however, uh, we can collect the information and how to resolve those, uh, 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 those problems. That's a good idea. Yeah, that, that's, uh, uh, we can do that and we can uh, give this message to the government. And also, as I told you, we have uh, so many reliable friends, partners, and we can communicate with them. Then uh, anyhow, this has to be uh, resolved in the, this uh, geopolitical things as soon as possible. Besides, one more thing is uh, financial problems throughout the world. This is uh, very serious. Then how to resolve uh, this situation? It used to be this, this will be resolved by the country, but uh, now this financial business problem is now globally, you know, developed. That is also very much related to the business. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. Tony. Um, for me, I think both sides of my have, have kind of dealt with it. I think communication is key. And business can uh, get more business leaders together to tell the leaders of what Victor said. You know, despite your geopolitical tensions, this is what's happening in the real world. And if you guys could get your act together, look at what, look at what could happen. So I think giving real examples and putting people first is what business can do. And keep communicating. I mean, I'll, I'll tell a funny little story just before uh, we end. Indonesia and Malaysia, we always have little battles and, and differences, etc. Uh, and a, one of the former presidents, there was a talk about Indonesia invading Malaysia, and the former president said to me, so Tony, who would you support if Indonesia goes to war with Malaysia? I said, very simple, sir. Uh, AirAsia Malaysia would send the Malaysian soldiers to Indonesia, and AirAsia Indonesia would send the uh, Indonesian soldiers to Malaysia. We are truly ASEAN uh, <laughs> all the way. So, I mean, I think communication is the key, yeah. and really putting people first, and getting across, business can get across to examples of leaders that if you can sort your political differences out, look at the benefit to the people. Perfect. Victor, the last word's yours, briefly. Yes, I think... Um, over and above what my colleagues have said, I think we need to cooperate, deepen the cooperation, build trust, and there are many important sectors that's completely non-controversial. For example, business can help regionally to promote gender diversity. Business can help um, to promote um, a more, a better elderly care. In, for example, Japan has a great expertise and experience there. China and the rest of the region are are having the, this aging um, challenges. There's a lot that we can cooperate. We can also help to provide a safe and healthy environment for the region. Uh, um, you know, benchmarking up standards about how to manage 
uh, crisis involving uh, infectious disease and also a force majeure. So these are the areas where this absolute non-controversial help adding value to society, deepen cooperation, deepen trust, and therefore, hopefully, the politics can follow. Well, thank you. Those are all very concrete and very useful suggestions. The next challenge you all have is to actually implement them. But thank you all very much for a very good discussion. Thank you.